Good evening. Uh, my name is Georgina Jackson. I'm the director of exhibitions here at my studio. I'm really delighted that so many of you could come and join us this evening for the seventh in our series of forum talks. So for those of you who don't know about forum, we initiated last July. And it really is a kind of monthly discussion across a broad number of subjects and kind of bringing a lot of, gathering a lot of different disciplines. So we've had people from theatre, we've had people from, I'm mean, talking about Marshall McLuhan, Mick Conley's book in the TV Museum. And tonight we're really delighted to have two very special people with us this evening. Um, so Suhail Malik is the 2012-2015 visiting faculty at CCS Bard in New York and program co-director of the MFA in Fine Art at Goldsmiths London, where he holds a readership in critical studies. Malik writes in political economy, theory, and arts axioms, and his forthcoming book uh, is titled On the Necess Necessity of Arts Exit from Contemporary Art, which comes out from Urban, Urban Omics. This month, next month? Uh, <laughs> next version. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then Nick Cernick is a PhD graduate in international relations from the London School of Economics. He's the author of Postcapitalist Technologies, Inventing the Future with Alex Williams, and editor of the speculative term with Levi Bryant and Graham Harmon. So I'd also like to thank uh, the team here at Mercy Union, Katie Lyle, Stuart Lathbridge, Rihanna Schmidt, and Daniel Greer, our board who are really wonderful, the volunteers who are here this evening, the Canada Council, the Tr Toronto Arts Council, and the Ontario Arts Council, and then also special thanks to the Hal Jackman Foundation who've really supported the forum series, which has been fantastic. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Nick. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? No? Okay, I'll move a bit closer then. Is that better? No? Okay. Right in there. Um, so thank you everybody for coming along. Um, so what I want to talk about today is essentially um, what exactly does post-capitalism mean today and also what sort of function can art serve uh, in trying to bring about post-capitalism? Um, I want to begin from essentially two facts which I think are relatively uncontroversial, although maybe we can discuss them. Um, but one, the first fact is the sort of immense desire that we see on the part of people around the world uh, for a new world, for something different. And on the other hand is this fact that uh, the Occupy movement has failed, uh, the anti-globalization movement has failed, and the anti-war movement during the 2000s also failed. And so despite millions of people across the world coming out to try and um, bring about a new world, try to change things, uh, these things have failed. And so I think for the basis of any sort of leftism today, the fundamental question to be asked at the start is what has gone wrong? Uh, I think there's a number of different answers to this. The one I want to focus on tonight uh, in particular is this lack of a vision of the future, uh, the lack of a vision of post-capitalism and what that might mean. Uh, now, it may seem a bit controversial to say that, didn't Occupy have a sort of idea of a better world? I think actually if you look at what Occupy had, it had a negative critique of the world. It had an image of inequality that it wanted to get rid of. But how to actually do that, it was never really, uh, it never mobilized around a single way to do that. So you had people making arguments for financial reform. You had people making arguments to redistribute via, uh, uh, via taxes in the welfare system. You had people making arguments about ending the Federal Reserve as the way to bring about uh, less inequality. And of course, you had people arguing, well, we need to end capitalism. But Occupy itself was confused about exactly what the future would look like. There was a variety of different positions, but none of them actually uh, coalesced into some sort of enticing vision of a better world. Uh, so I think Occupy lacked a vision of the future. And if you look at the mainstream left, um, so I'm thinking in particular of social democratic parties, uh, or trade union as well, essentially what you have is an argument that we should return to the good sort of post-war era of social democracy. And of course, the social democratic era was premised upon colonialism across the world. It was premised upon a rigid gender binary within the workforce. Uh, and it was premised upon uh, numerous sort of uh, 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 domestic hierarchies. I don't think social democracy is something that we actually want to go back to. Uh, and I think we can actually do better than a return to social democracy. Uh, so mainstream left essentially has a vision of what we should do in terms of the past. If we look at the radical left, I think it's actually a very similar position as well. Largely it's critical, it's very, very good at analyzing exactly what the issues are, and what the problems are with global capitalism, but in terms of what actually we should have, it either offers sort of unenticing visions of sort of small-scale communes or it just has no answer whatsoever. Um, I don't think 
the radical left has an answer about what the future should be like either. So we have a sort of dearth of the future, uh, both in the cultural sense, uh, but also in the mainstream left and the radical left. And so I think one thing, one task that the left needs to do today is to imagine a better world. Uh, and this means both a sort of practical idea about what exactly could be implemented, what can be achieved, but it also means fostering a utopian imagination. Uh, and I think art in general has a very uh, uh, important role in terms of sort of fostering this affect for a better world, uh, the idea of hope, uh, and imagining that we're not just stuck within um, capitalist realism, as Mark Fisher puts it. So I want to discuss then what is a sort of desirable and viable future. And I think any sort of image of the future has to be both of these. It has to be desirable to a mass amount of people, but it also has to be viable so it's not just a sort of naive utopia. So what does this mean today? What do we think uh, this future could mean today? Or to put it in another way, what does post-capitalism mean today? Uh, now, just an aside here, why do I prefer to use the term post-capitalism? Um, I think there's been a death of the old signifiers. So traditionally, communism was a signifier for something beyond capitalism. Uh, but communism is now so tarnished, uh, particularly in the Western world, uh, as a term that's associated with sort of a Stalinist regime, um, state takeover by revolution, which nobody believes can occur today, uh, and a sort of dictatorship of the proletariat, where you know, various oppressions are put aside until the revolution is fully complete. So I think communism as a signifier of what is beyond capitalism doesn't function anymore, uh, at least within the Western world. I think equally socialism doesn't work as a particularly good signifier. Uh, socialism brings forth sort of ideas of social democracy uh, and particularly brings forth ideas of electoralism. So this idea that the way to bring about a better uh, a sort of post-capitalist future is simply to get a mass amount of votes uh, for you know, the Labour Party or the Liberal Party, whatever the case may be. Uh, clearly, this hasn't worked, and so I think socialism um, has been so, so tarnished with these ideas uh, that we need to give up on it as a signifier as well. So I use sort of post-capitalism as a generic term for something beyond capitalism. Um, but that being said, I think there's a sort of emergent discourse around what exactly post-capitalism might mean. Uh, particularly in the UK, there's this term called luxury communism, uh, which some of you may have heard which I think is a brilliant sort of paradoxical term. You don't normally associate uh, luxury and communism together. Uh, or in my own work, it's sort of been called um, a left accelerationism. Broadly, what these things point to, though, is a world of a post-work future, where work is reduced as much as possible, uh, machines take as much work uh, as humanly possible, but it's also a post-scarcity world. So it doesn't mean that we're all living in poverty. Uh, it means actually we have as much abundance as humanly possible. Uh, and environmentally possible, I should also mention. Um, but this is sort of what luxury communism puts forth as an idea for post-capitalism, a post-work and a post-scarcity future. Now, I think this builds upon existing tendencies that, existing tendencies within capitalism that the left or any sort of political movement today needs to grapple with, whether it wants to or not. Uh, and this is the, the tendency towards automation. Uh, so we see stories in the mainstream media nowadays about robots taking jobs. Um, I think it's important to remember that actually capitalism is sort of premised upon a constant revolution of the means of production. It's premised upon uh, constantly mechanizing and automating labor. Uh, so this is a long, long process in history of capitalism. But the sort of automation that's going on today is different from what's preceded it. Uh, and particularly... Uh, what you see today is uh, non-routine work being automated. So this is work that normally requires some flexibility, requires some sort of intelligence in order to be able to do it. Uh, sort of uh, a good example is Google's self-driving car. So this is something which is very, very difficult uh, and impossible to do for a repetitive machine. Um, it's a non-routine task which is now being automated. And there's a whole variety of these things which are increasingly being automated uh, and taken away. And so this non-routine work has been historically the preserve of human laborers. Um, oftentimes, um, at the low-skill labor force in terms of cleaners, things like this, which do manual labor, uh, but also at higher levels, uh, say managerial work. But also automation is all, uh, uh, automating today is automating cognitive work. So traditionally, automation has been doing manual work. We think of this most uh, obviously factory work. Uh, but today, it's also doing cognitive labor. Uh, so we can think about machines which can now write journals to articles, 
um, things like Watson, IBM's Watson, uh, which are capable of giving diagnoses of uh, uh, medical cases, or um, even the sort of automation of legal precedents, research and legal precedents, uh, is now ongoing. So all this sort of cognitive labor, which has again been sort of the preserve of human, uh, human labor, is now disappearing. And so I think this new wave of automation is something different from the past, and there is a real sort of issue about what this means uh, in terms of work and in terms of our economies. So I think the main sort of thing that these things mean is a production of surplus populations. So this is an old Marxist term about a production of a part of humanity which capitalism just doesn't need. Uh, it's, a, it's a part of humanity which needs to work in order to be able to survive. They don't have access to wage labor, uh, but they don't have access to wage labor, rather. Uh, and so they're essentially tossed aside uh, as essentially surplus to capitalism. And so essentially, if automation is taking all of these jobs, what we're likely to see is the production of a larger and larger surplus population. Now, I think it's important to mention, though, that surplus populations aren't just expressed in terms of unemployment numbers. Uh, so if we look at the U.S., for instance, right now, unemployment is actually back down to a relative normal. Um, so if you look at the U.S., it doesn't seem like there's a production of surplus populations there. But surplus populations is also expressed in a number of other ways. Uh, so it's expressed in lower quality jobs or the increased precarity of jobs. So if there's more and more, a larger and larger workforce looking for jobs, this means that employers then have more power over workers. They can make the jobs shittier and shittier. Uh, and this is exactly what we have seen over the past 20 and 30 years. There's an increased precarity of jobs. Uh, you also see jobless recoveries, where after a recession occurs, the economy starts growing again, but jobs don't come back. Uh, and this is, again, exactly what you've seen over the past 30 years. Uh, so in Europe, for instance, actually, if you look globally, um, it's estimated that the number of jobs we had before the 2008 crisis is not going to come back until 2018. So a full decade before, we actually have the same number of jobs as what we had before. And I think this is, again, a sort of symptom of the fact that there's all this excess labor for capital, and it doesn't know what to do with it. Now, you'll also see with surplus populations... Um, a growth of slums. So slums are essentially where an informal labor force goes to live when it's been tossed off of its own land, it's been forced into urban spaces, but it doesn't have an income or a job in order to be able to support its own housing. So slums are the result of a surplus population. Uh, and Mike Davis points out, for instance, there's about one billion people in the world today, uh, so one out of seven, I guess, um, now living in slums. So this is a massive amount of humanity has already been tossed aside. And then finally, I think we also see surplus populations uh, in terms of urban marginality. So we can think about in terms of ghettos in America, uh, uh, council estates in the UK, uh, and banned loons in France. Um, so the sort of segregated areas of cities where people just can't find jobs and become essentially jobless for their entire lives have to turn to informal and illegal economies in order to be able to live. And I think all of this is essentially a symptom of the fact that capitalism doesn't produce enough jobs for us anymore. Uh, and this is only going to get worse with automation. Um, so one common statistic which is thrown around uh, is that the next wave of automation is likely within the next two decades to take away 47% uh, of current U.S. jobs. Uh, now a similar study has been done for Europe, and it suggests actually in Europe 54% of current European jobs are likely to be automated over the next two decades. So I think this is an ongoing trend of capitalism and it's something that any sort of future-oriented left needs to face up to, uh, needs to prepare for. Now I think the obvious sort of response is to say, well, this is a massive crisis. What are we going to do? I think what the left should do is not see it as a crisis, but see it as an opportunity. This is exactly what we would want to occur if we wanted a post-work world. Now the big question is, well, how do we actually enable people to have an income without a job? Uh, things like a universal basic income are sort of the obvious response, uh, particularly as a sort of transitional step to a full post-capitalist society. So there's ways that we can mobilize and build towards a post-work society. Now the big question is exactly how do we actually do this? How do we achieve this post-capitalist world? I think the primary answer has to be a sort of counter-hegemonic project. As a basic sort of Gramscian argument, and Gramsci was looking at when he was strategizing about what the left should do, he was looking at a situation where the left was weak, 
The left didn't have any power, and the left wasn't about to overthrow states in order to bring about a new world. And I think this is exactly what we find ourselves in today, a very similar situation in which what we have to do is prepare the social conditions for political change. And so I think a counter-hegemonic project in the broad sense uh, is sort of the, the goal, the, the overarching strategy of what the left needs to do today. But I want to focus on one particular aspect, uh, which relates to art. And this is uh, the idea of cognitive mapping. Uh, so Friedrich Jameson has this idea of cognitive mapping, uh, in which essentially it's a matter of taking a global capitalist totality and situating our own selves within this, to uh, th this totality. And Jameson's argument is that essentially this has become impossible under the conditions of globalization. Uh, so at one point, with national capitalism, you can make sort of sense of your own position within the economic system. You were a particular class, you had a particular historical role, and you had a particular uh, uh, set of interests which you wanted to achieve. Now, under conditions of globalization, this is all sort of disrupted. And Jameson says, well, we've, we've lost the means to cognitively map things. Now, I think he's right, but I think there's two ways to sort of overcome this deficit of cognitive mapping. Now, the one way is through technical models. And I mean this in the sort of mathematical, statistical, abstract, formal modeling um, that's sort of associated with mainstream economics. But I think actually the left could do very, very similar things um, and come to a very interesting sort of uh, uh, mapping of the capitalist totality. Obviously not following, uh, say, neoclassical economics exactly, um, classes instead of individuals, most obviously. But... Um, I think technical modeling is an absolute necessity in terms of cognitively mapping where we are today. But technical modeling leaves us, uh, uh, it doesn't give us much traction on the world today. So there's these formal models, we see, say, a mathematical analysis, it's still very hard to make sense of where we personally stand within global capitalism. And this is where Jameson, and I agree with him, sees a role for aesthetics. He sees the role for aesthetics in translating between that abstract sort of mapping of capitalism and the sort of intuitive phenomenological relationship that we have to our everyday lives. And aesthetics is precisely the sort of mediation between those two. Now, I think the way that, I think there are some um, um, artists who have attempted to do this before, uh, but at least what I've seen, they tend to remain in what I call the technical sublime, which is to say you create an aesthetic representation of capitalism but it's purely a sort of meant to be an awe-inspiring thing, as though here's capitalism, look how complex and difficult it is and how overbearing it is, but it doesn't offer you any purchase upon your own situation within, uh, within capitalism or within history, uh, and it doesn't offer you any sort of leverage over what to do. And so I think there's too much remaining at the sort of technical sublime. Uh, one of my favorite examples is sort of uh, Ryoji Ikeda's work, where it's a sort of overarching, over like uh, 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 whelming experience of just you know a massive amount of data thrown at you, but you have no way to make sense of it, no way to act upon it at all. Uh, and I think this is what a lot of aesthetics is left at uh, when it tries to represent capitalism. So I think what we need essentially is some way to aesthetically render capitalism in ways which avoid this technical sublime, which offers us no real cognitive purchase on capitalism. But we also need to avoid a simple sort of consolidation of capitalism, which you know, repeats truisms, or uh, uh, Suhail and I were talking about this a bit earlier, or just turns into a sort of form of like data visualization. Uh, it's not that simple. And I think art here has a number, a sort of flexibility, which enables it to do really interesting things in bridging the gap between the technical model of capitalism and our intuitive experiences of capitalism. So I think this is really important because it enables people to have a way to navigate towards a post-capitalist world, to make sense of their own position within the world, and to make sense of their own position within uh, a broader overarching historical narrative. So it's not just an overwhelming confusion of data, and it's not just an overwhelming confusion of stress and precarity, uh, which I think is the experience most of us have in our lives. Uh, so I think cognitive mapping is important, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. oh, and so the, um, the photo I put up here, you can't see it very well, but this is from um, a Chilean experiment called Cybersyn in the 1970s, uh, where if you don't know about it, it was essentially an, uh, an experiment to do a sort of decentralized form of a, uh, decentralized planning uh, uh, of an economy. 
And so they built essentially a proto-socialist internet, uh, and they had a sort of um, social media thing going on, but they also had these models of the economy, uh, and sort of really interesting visualizations like this one, uh, trying to model the Chilean economy in order to sort of forewarn a possible crisis, uh, and then act upon the economy in order to keep it within a, a, an equilibrium. Uh, so yeah, interesting example, I think. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I, I can see that there's a bunch of people backing up, and I'm wondering if the people at the hallway can come forward, or there's a bunch of space along these walls just to make space for people to come in, or not. Um, okay, uh, let me just go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, um, I, my, my talk is going to be somewhat less um, global <laughs> than, than Nick's, uh, necessarily, because I'm going to talk about a very restricted small field called art. Um, my startup is this one. Okay. Um, broadly, just, just to set the parameters of what I'll, what I'll be talking about, I'm, I'm basically a firm, the project of left accelerationism uh, and the move towards post capitalism. Um, uh, with some reservations, and I'll come to those reservations in the context of what Nick has said later on towards the end. Um, the, the argument will be uh, basically the broad affirmation of left accelerationism, uh, then that contemporary art cannot do what's needed for left accelerationism. Uh, in other words, contemporary art is not adequate to constructing post-capitalism. Um, and then what we need to ask is what should art do, what should it be? if we're interested in constructing a post-capitalism. And post-capitalism isn't something that happens to us, it's something that needs to be constructed. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll start essentially, um, I'll use this, this uh, abbreviation for left accelerationism with a capitalized L, distinct from right accelerationism with a capitalized R. Um, if you don't know, uh, uh, it's all about the hashtags, that's what I've been told about accelerationism. So, uh, I forgot my hashtags. I'm old. So it's, um, if you don't know right accelerationism, the argument is, is something like capitalism of itself and through its own internal dynamics constructs what's called the singularity, which is the transition of the dominant intelligent form from humans to essentially intelligent machines. Um, and this is something that capitalism is a vector towards. Uh, and so the, what we need to do to, to uh, uh, get to the next stage of intelligence, which will no longer be human intelligence, is ramp up capitalism, right? So push capitalism, and there's a version of this, uh, and I think it's important to clarify, uh, a version of accelerationism, which is like, let's just ramp ex uh, capitalism as, as fast as we can, as maximum as we can, till either it implodes or explodes, which is a kind of 1970s formulation, or until the singularity arrives through capitalism. Uh, left accelerationism is not that. Uh, it's a careful project of uh, what well, Nick will tell us what it is because he invented the term. So. <laughs> but it's a careful project to basically build on current existing technologies and societies in order to advance them towards post capitalism. Right? There's obviously not a linear logic in that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an engineering task. Um, okay, just to step back a minute into contemporary art. The broad thesis uh, which I'm developing and will come out in the book that Georgina mentioned earlier is that uh, contemporary art, we can characterize contemporary art as a kind of anythingness. Anything can be contemporary art. Okay? And this anythingness is not to do with the, uh, the, the medium, it's not to do with the material, it's not to do with the content. These are all kind of modernist notions of what art is. Contemporary art, of course, is defined by its plurality and uh, its multiplicity in all of those, in all of those aspects. Uh, but also, more importantly for me, contemporary art is, is defined by its indeterminacy. Now, this indeterminacy is not just to do with what the art is, but also to do with its semantic content. So the contemporary artwork, and this exhibition is an interesting context to do it in, because it seems to me this is not contemporary art. Okay? The, the work that's being shown in this room, and somewhat in the next room, more ambivalently, uh, is very directed. It doesn't leave much space for a viewer to kind of make their way through it. And that, that's atypical of a contemporary art uh, type of practice. Um, so the indeterminacy of contemporary art is to do essentially with the viewer or the audience or the recipient of the work, making of the work what they can, what they will. It's the primacy of interpretation. 
There are lots of models of this going from the death of the author through Bart to the open text in uh, Inverter Echo, more recently Jacques Rancière's notion of the emancipated spectator. Meaning construction takes place by the viewer, not by the artwork and not by the artist. What this means is that the artwork has to be indeterminate in itself to leave space for the viewer. Okay? Dogmatic work, doctrinaire work and so on are all prohibited or decried by contemporary art. Um, what, this, what this indeterminacy means is two things. Firstly, contemporary art forms a kind of genre of work because we can characterize it through its indeterminacy. It's a genre which doesn't have any identity. All right? Uh, so it's very hard to locate the parameters of the horizon of contemporary art because it can be anything, because uh, there's no semantic uh, horizon or arrival or definition of it through its anythingness and through the always individual and singular interpretation that constitutes the work. Right? But that's a kind of, if you want a family resemblance or a genre of what work is, at the level of the address of the work, but not its content, not its medium and so on and so forth. Um, so it's identityless. We can't locate it in any specific place, both as a type of work, but also, of course, geographically and increasingly historically. Okay? Um, uh, so we have, we have a type of work which is identityless, but nonetheless constitutes a kind of stranglehold on what art should now be and should now do. Okay? It's a hegemonic form of art within the art system. And this hegemonic form of art within the art system uh, maps very well into how contemporary art has become the plaything of the idol rich. Okay? Uh, and we need to understand why that is, why despite all the political claims in contemporary art, which is sort of soft leftist to hard leftist, or kind of anarcho leftist, uh, for all of these, these uh, you know, impassioned, uh, heartfelt demands and claims at the level of the content of the work, which are usually emancipatory, socially responsible and so forth, uh, contemporary art is, works very well within the, uh, uh, within the global elite regime. The point being there's no contradiction between the two because the global elite understand themselves as moral agents and contemporary art certifies that for them. This is a side problem we can talk about later. The, 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 the systemic issue or the, the uh, generic issue is that as a genre without identity um, and with this insistence upon the singular, uh, the always singular, the always personalised uh, semantic uh, meaning, the, the, the semantics of the work, contemporary art is necessarily asystemic. Okay? It plays a systemic role, but it never, it's never responsible to its systemic conditions. Contemporary art, um, uh, and here I distinguish, I mean, of course, through all of this, I'm not talking about art in general, but of contemporary art in particular. Um, contemporary art, through its plurality, through its multiplicity, through its openness of, of uh, determination, um, uh, all of which is supported by critical theory or critical virtue, if you want, uh, doesn't prohibits, almost prescribes uh, systemic responsibility of the artwork itself. Why? Because if it was systemically responsible and if it could be systemically located, its semantic indeterminacy would close down. Okay? So insofar as there is semantic indeterminacy, insofar as that's the defining condition of contemporary art, it cannot have a systemic, a systemic place. Okay, for itself, it cannot declare its ascending place because that would sort of evaporate the play of the work, if you want. So, it's asystemic as regards the general infrastructures of our society, to which it nonetheless claims to speak. So there's a deception or a mendacity, a constitutive mendacity in contemporary art. But it's also asystemic as regards the art system which is why we end up in the kind of paradoxes that we're all familiar with, in which contemporary art makes a lot of noise about the, the, the kind of conditions that Nick was describing earlier of what our global and particular societies are, uh, uh, makes a lot of noise about the marketization, for example, of contemporary art, the, the integration between the public, uh, the public spaces of contemporary art and those market sectors through the gallery network and so on, and yet can't do anything about it through the artwork itself, generally speaking. So the, the problem with contemporary art is that in its content and its claims, it may be, it may be uh, wanting to address uh, social conditions uh, and, and in a responsible and sort of moral way, but at the same time, because of this insistence, because of this, it's not an insistence, it's a kind of requirement for contemporary art to be what it is, it's incapable of doing that. Okay? 
it has to be a systemic in its role, which is also why it can serve other systems like the global elite very well. It doesn't have any structural capacity or structural uh, traction to, to be able to challenge those uh, take-ups, those, those um, demands on art, on, on, those demands from art very well. Um, so the net result is contemporary art pros proscribed, prohibits art and its content from being a systemic actor. It's always only an individuated or singular actor. Okay? It may take a systemic role, but that's not a role that art can avow for itself. If it did, it wouldn't be contemporary art anymore. Okay? So what do we do? Well, if you want to do left accelerationism, this is obviously a systemic political program. Right? And, it, and in, the, in the terms that uh, Nick and uh, Alex Williams have recently developed, it's a, we can identify what the program is for. It's for post-capitalism, not for communism, socialism, and so on, for the reasons Nick has just said. What this means is that as a systemic political program, uh, contemporary art is not adequate to left accelerationism. Okay? And here you, you have to make a simple choice. Either you opt for contemporary art, because that's our convention, and it's the hegemonic form of art, but then you have to understand that it's going to be impossible to do any of the things that Nick has described uh, and, and, and the rest of us are describing as a left accelerationist program or demand. Or you say that, yes, that left accelerationist program and demand are the right thing, uh, right, in terms of morally right, rather than politically right, uh, are, are, are the required thing, in which case we have to abandon contemporary art. Okay? And that's, of course, the correct thing to do. Okay? Which, is, which, is, which is a problem, because we're committed to it. And one of the reasons we're committed to it is because through uh, critique, through political education, through, uh, I mean, through art schools, political education uh, sometimes, um, the, uh, the, the claims of contemporary art are, of course, very much in line with the claims of left accelerationism. And there might be an attempt to just collapse those into each other and say, well, of course, if left, left accelerationism is interested in the post-capitalist future, uh, contemporary art is interested in a kind of non-capitalist, uh, advancing non-capitalism, therefore we're doing the same thing. But systemically, and if you want, formally or institutionally, or I would say constitutively with contemporary art, it's not possible. Contemporary art prohibits it. So if you, if you take the left accelerationist route, and I urge you all to do that, um, left accelerationism has to make a demand on art. Now, this is an anathema to our conventions of art. Right? It's an anathema that arises from autonomy arguments, from art as a spontaneous activity arguments, and also from the artist as a kind of uh, free actor, a kind of uh, anarchist, in a way, or as, a, or as, a, uh, as exactly an asystemic actor. Because what one should never do is make a demand for art, because art should spontaneously arrive at its own conclusions and do whatever it wishes to do, in, a, in, a, in an argument that's supported by modernist autonomy claims, and Adorno was the key figure in this. But those arguments aren't as restricted to modernism, they still persist now through a celebration of the artist, uh, which of course has to be undone. So left accelerationism has to make a demand on art, uh, or rather it does make a demand on art, and the question is whether art is capable of receiving that demand and responding to it adequately. Um, so the, the net upshot is that contemporary art is inadequate to advancing post-capitalism. Um, but that's not to say that art is inadequate to advancing post-capitalism. What's needed in the current formula that I have adopted is we need another art than contemporary art in order to get to post-capitalism. Um, Okay, so what's, what's, sorry, my slides are a little out of order. Let me just kind of, um, I think a whole bunch of slides have dropped out. What's needed then, if we, if we want to think of art in terms of, and this is the question, what can art do for post-capitalism? What it shouldn't do is contemporary art. <laughs> what it should do, we need an art that's uh, more adequate in a way to something uh, that, that doesn't uh, consolidate uh, current dominant uh, power, uh, dominant power forms uh, of, sorry, dominant power forms of society, uh, and we need a genre then 
of art that, in a way, doesn't, doesn't accommodate itself, doesn't allow itself to be accommodated within those dominant forms. So what can, what can art do for post-capitalism? Well, we don't need to abandon everything. Um, let me just see. Yeah, okay. We don't need to abandon everything uh, of art as we know it from contemporary art. Uh, there are a number of things I think that we can take advantage of in contemporary art. Firstly, art seems a particularly good place for transdisciplinarity. Uh, for, for, for any particular artwork, there's no particular need to be restricted to the experts in your own field. One can reach out to anything. And also, as we know, art, because of its generic anythingness, can uh, call on and goes to anything it wishes to. So there's a kind of flexibility and mutability and adaptability in contemporary art that seems to me incredibly important, kind of unique within the current academic structures uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the versatility of art, which it's actually quite hard to find in other disciplines. So I think this, this, this seems an important condition for uh, transformations, okay? disciplinary transformations, transformations in knowledge, and transformations of how and where to act uh, across standard disciplines. It's... Uh, contemporary art, of course, and art is also proximate to power and to money, which seems quite important for a political project. Um, so that seems an advantage for art to left accelerationism. Uh, and also, this is because we're in Toronto and McClure and yada yada. Um, uh, I mean, I'm sure you're probably tired of people coming in saying, oh, I'm in Toronto, I'm watching McClure. I mean, I, I feel that too. But. Um, what art is very good at uh, and in a way what's most impressive about it is its commitment to mediatic intervention. Usually in critical discourse this is, called, this is talked about as uh, mediatic reflexivity or uh, self-reflection, but it seems to me the contemporary model, the, the model that we need to think about now isn't so much in terms of critique and criticality, which is the contemporary art model, but about interventions and construction. Okay? And what art does and what art is very expert in, at a level of the individual rather than just systemic or institutional operators, is intervening in media. Those media aren't just film and TV and the internet and so on, but of course things like painting, text, and all the uh, space, time, and so on and so forth. So it seems to me that these three things are important resources uh, for, for that, that can be used by left accelerationism towards, uh, towards post-capitalism, which art can, can, can help advance. So I think art, in a way, can be, even contemporary art, in a way, can be a resource for left accelerationism towards post-capitalism, uh, but only a resource. And it's important that, as a resource, it doesn't get taken up as contemporary art. Right? Two ways to do this from left accelerationism prohibit anything that's contemporary art from entering into the program. Secondly, from within art, uh, uh, cleanse itself if you want, or like abandon, abandon the dogmas of contemporary art or the claims to indeterminacy, and most importantly, abandon uh, and, and forcibly abandon the, the insistence on singularity of the artwork. Okay. What's important, and I think why, why I'm particularly interested in this show, is that the exhibition and the, the, the films that are being shown here uh, don't make any claims around the singularity of reception, but are about the systemic operation of both the people portrayed, but also the films themselves as social actors, the systemic actors themselves. Uh, and then let me just kind of start heading towards a close uh, and to talk about cognitive mapping. Uh, and I think this is a point of nuanced disagreement with, with Nick, although he's, he's uh, s stolen my argument and repudiated it. Uh, I knew I shouldn't have told him what I was going to say before we started. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> um, okay, cognitive mapping. What, is, what does cognitive mapping do? And I think here I've got some... Uh, yeah, sorry, my slides were out of order. Um, okay, I think the claim about cognitive mapping is basically to produce a map or an image which, which gives a sense of uh, orientation around the complexity of the world. That, that's necessarily a reduction of what the world is, as all maps are not the world, and so on and so forth. Um, but this picture, this picture, which would be the cognitive map, and of course it's not necessarily just a visual picture, it could be a sonic picture or a spatial picture and so on through sculpture and so forth. Um, 
The question is whether, whether in, in, the, in the interest in making a map, in producing clarity of the conditions in which we are, which would allow us to orientate ourselves in the present, to navigate our way to the future, and these are common terms in left acceleration discourse, whether by doing that we don't in fact lose something fundamental about the conditions in which we are, which is that they're complex and that they're somewhat unnavigatable. And maybe this is the appropriate form for our societies and the forms of societies for post-capitalism. Okay? If left accelerationism is interested in advancing what's best about our societies, which I take to be, um, uh, I take to be let me, this, oops, not this. <laughs> it's also this, importantly, <laughs> but it's this orientation because the societies in which we live in are large scale they're complex and they're integrated. This is what globalization means, both at the level of the globe, but also in any particular locale. Right? No matter how unconnected it is, it's nonetheless affected by globalization. So if left accelerationism is interested in advancing what we have as large-scale, complex, integrated societies, it seems to me there's a necessary sense in which we cannot make sense of them in, in, a, in, a, in a schematic way. Okay? And that's right. So the problem with cognitive mapping is in a way it reduces disorientation too far. And disorientation is the condition for the kind of societies that we have and the societies that I think left accelerationism should head towards as post-capitalist. And this might be a disagreement between Nick and I. Uh, I think it's something that we can, we can discuss later. So the problem with the, with, the, um, with the cognitive mapping argument for me is that it sounds a lot like data visualization. Right, data visualization, lots of stuff floating around the world, you extract data from it through sensors and so on and so forth, and you produce a schematic diagram which shows you how to make sense of things, the relative scales, orders, sizes, importances, calibration, and so on and so forth. But of course what's very clear in that is data visualization is not the complexity of things. It allows you to get a schematic picture of it, to conceptualize it, to own what the world uh, is in its complexity, but it's, it's precisely a reduction of that complexity. It can add further to complexity, right? but it's a, it's a limitation. So I think here, here is a place that uh, we could look to art, or art can do something to intervene. What, what's important is to understand that art, whatever intervention art makes, would not be on the basis, again, of the interpretive model. Okay? It would not be about the singularity of the artwork, the singularity of your semantic uh, construction of what the Alpacan is doing and so forth, it would be us as a systemic operator. Um, I have to move back to... Uh, yeah, it would, be, it would be back to this point. So if we take us as a systemic operator, um, what, what's usually required from other forms of visualisation of, of uh, societies and globalization and so forth is a kind of comprehensive schematic reduction of what those things are. What it seems to me art can do is uh, not do that stuff. Right? It has a license to not make sense. Now, this is, I think, uh, there's a risk in this of reproducing the technological sublime and a kind of uh, an interest in bewilderment and awesomeness of what of what, where we are because we can't orientate ourselves and so on and so forth. But I wonder if there's a way in which through art what we can emphasize is as, as a systemic operator okay, is emphasize the, the, um, the, the complexity of conditions, demonstrate the complexity of conditions and, and put forward a demand of what we do in the face of that complexity, qua complexity. Now, I understand, as I've just said, I understand the risk that that heads towards a, techno a technological sublime, which is incapacitating, insofar as all you can do with the sublime is be awestruck. But actually, since you're at the limits of your sensible perception, it's hard to, it's impossible with the sublime to move beyond the term of the sublime. And that would clearly prohibit the construction of a post-capitalist society. But I wonder whether art's uh, refusal to... Uh, uh, reduce for the sake of clarity which I take to be Nick's demand um, maybe unfairly uh, whether that refusal of the reduction to clarity can produce images and uh, cognition okay, of, 
of complexity, of large scaleness, of integration, and of, therefore what our societies now are. And here, I think, um, what we can do is, is as, and also what art can do, is therefore amplify and ramify complexity, large scaleness, integration, and so on and so forth. Art can be the constructive vector of the kind of societies that uh, we, we, we'd head towards through, um, through post-capitalism. And of course, just to emphasize, post-capitalism is not the reduction of capitalist-like societies, I think. It's an it's a, it's a exacerbation of, of the advanced, uh, technically adept moments of capitalist societies without the capitalism, and that's, that's the hard ask. Here, then, I think uh, it's important to avoid uh, the, the, the uh, in a way, the go-to claims for art, which is around affect and the utopian image, for two reasons. One, I think the affective moment sounds a bit like a propagandistic arm for stuff that's going on elsewhere. I think what art can do is precisely produce cognition of large-scale, complex, integrated conditions, if not societies, um, in ways that advance those very conditions. And secondly, it's not utopian because art can do it now. Okay? So it's not that art has produced images of something that's going to happen elsewhere in the future, but art generates the more advanced, the more complex, the more integrated image now, here. Um, and I think we should start today. Thank you. Yeah, I might just respond, I think, to your, your points. Um, I think we're broadly in agreement. I think what you're sort of pointing to between complexity and clarity, broadly speaking, I think it's just a sort of inherent tension within the aesthetic function of cognitive mapping. Um, I think staying at the pole of, say, complexity renders us incapable of operating on that aesthetic representation, but the alternative is, you know, our, uh, pure clarity, which tends to function just as, I mean, if you want some interesting visualizations of global capitalism, look at what financial traders use on their computers. It is a perfectly clear sort of representation of global finance. It's fascinating. It's aesthetically pleasing, um, but it just it serves to reproduce capitalism. Uh, and I think what art can do, and I think it should do, and I'm in agreement with you, uh, is sort of straddle those two lines between, say, clarity and complexity, which is difficult, but that's what I think is quite an interesting function of art. Can you um, give us some uh, specific examples of artist projects uh, or artist interventions um, that you think have been successful? Uh, no, I refuse to do that. Um, and the reason I refuse to do it is because I think the demand for specific and particulars is exactly the one that's the contemporary art demand. Right? Uh, and, and so it seems to me important to kind of speak uh, generically or axiomatically about art. And also because I think the risk of doing that is that the, um, the argument becomes about those practices. And my argument isn't about any particular practice. It's about a global demand in the sense of uh, an overall demand on what art, what art should be. Okay. I thought Joseph Boys would be a good example. Joseph Boys would be a good example. I didn't have Canadians with sarcasm. But. No, it's not sarcasm at all. I actually believe that the question you're asking, if you look at what Boys did from uh, the 60s on and his his actions and the social sculpture is kind of part of that moving out of the kind of uh, structures and things that you, you're sort of uh, talking about. No, emphatically not. Uh, okay. jo jo Joseph Boyce is very much about the contemporary art model of indeterminacy, uh, rather about uh, construction of meaning through reception. Okay. Right. So, I mean, Boyce might have been programmatic in terms of the schools, might have been programmatic in terms of fluxes and so on. But the, the genre of art he espoused was exactly, I mean, it's like foundational figure in contemporary art. So how do you, how, so you were talking a, a lot uh, earlier about abstraction and how um, part of mapping is locating ourselves within these abstractions. But you're not giving any uh, solid sort of places to locate where art can be. Uh, I understand there's not one answer. Uh, I don't understand necessarily your, uh, your definition of what contemporary is and how it needs to... Uh, be what, what you, you put it into, but so doesn't that contradict and support uh, what you're trying to fight in a way? Because it seems to me that you're talking about 
location and you're talking about around, but at the same time not giving specifics. Sorry, I, I'm not giving specifics, but okay. Nick is the one who's asking for speaking about content. I'm a political economist, I'm an artist. <laughs> I, I couldn't give you any examples because I don't know enough um, about it. I can point to some examples that I don't think work. Um, Mark Lombardi, I think, yeah. uh, conspiracy work. I think, you know, visually fascinating, aesthetically pleasing, but completely useless for understanding global capitalism or the, the global structure of power. Sure. So I think that's a good example of what doesn't work. Um, I was going to ask a question that kind of dovetails on that a little bit. Um, <laughs> And I was wondering what kind of resources uh, you see in the past um, for whether in politics moving beyond like kind of fragmentary neoliberalism or in art moving beyond kind of postmodern contemporary scene. And like what kind of resources, so is it important to kind of go to what happened before this? So in terms of theory, like back to kind of look at like large scale metaphysics and how that can be like adopted for the contemporary world like past after neoliberalism or in art like going back to like Owen Hatherley has to a kind of militant modernism to look at um, architecture and what kind of potential it had and how it was wasted. So yeah, I was just wondering kind of resources the past has for looking beyond her. I mean, it depends on what resources you mean. Um, so f philosophical resources, uh, I'm less and less inclined to believe philosophy has much to offer in terms of analyzing things. Uh, actually, I know you agree, so. Um, uh, there's also aesthetic resources, which I don't think I'm particularly qualified to say. Uh, that being said, um, I mean, there are fascinating examples of utopias, uh, liter uh, utopias in literature, um, which are quite interesting in terms of thinking about the problems that, say, a post-work world would face. Uh, and I think that that's quite interesting in its own case. Uh, but then there's political resources, which I'm more knowledgeable about. Um, and I hate to be that guy, but, you know, Marx is actually quite good on it. Um, so I think, you know, Marx has some resources which are quite interesting. Uh, and it's interesting when you go back and read, say, some of his work on the, 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 the end of work and the sort of arguing for a post-work society, how perverse the USSR was as a result like, compared to what Marx was saying. Um, so Marx saying that you know, the realm of freedom begins when work ends. And then the Soviet, uh, uh, the Soviet experiment basically saying, well, actually, we should have everybody work as hard as possible. We should scientifically manage them down to you know, the basic gestures. Um, and it's quite perverse uh, in terms of Marxism. So I think going back to Marx has some resources. Um, obviously needs to be massively updated for today, but there are some, some interesting things there. Yeah, I think, I think can I just, just, sorry, respond sorry. To, just respond to that? Um, I, um, it's a really difficult question, a bit because the question is what are we trying to address, whether we're trying to be theoretically consistent in which case we look to former doctrines to understand where we situate ourselves. In terms of those doctrines, are we trying to understand, given, given the conditions that we're in now, how do we act, what do we do, and what are we heading towards? So obviously the image of post-capitalism at this point is a theoretical fiction, right? But it's an important one, and it's a, if, I mean, the, the current term is a hyperstition. So it's something you put forward in order to kind of make it happen. Um, uh, and it seems to me that that's an act uh, of... of uh, Construction. It's not any one's construction. It's got to be a, a con social construction, um, and it's a political project. So my my thought is that yes, there are resources that one can use, but it almost has to be on an ad hoc basis. That actually the resources have to be in terms of, and this is this is I think the the kind of point of agreement, but also partial disagreement between Nick and I. That the, that what we need to do is kind of have good pictures of where we are, right. And those seem to come from, sub, from disciplines like economics, from geography, from history, and so on and so forth. Um, as, and in terms of just comprehending the conditions that we are in order to know how to go from here to there. Right? But also, in a way, what the affordances are in the present that we can construct our way out of it. Um, so UBI, universal basic income, is, a, is, a, is an idea that's been around for since at least the mid... I mean, Friedman came up with the 
uh, kind of reactionary uh, conservative version of it in the 70s? Well, Thomas Paine came up with it in whenever he was, 1700s. 1700s, yeah. 1700s right. Um, but more recently. <laughs> um, uh, it's been around since, say, since, since, the, since the efforts to get out of the welfare state model, right, from the right. But now it comes back as a kind of post-welfare welfare condition. Um, and it seems to me that's very important for us. And, and again, this is an argument in the art field about um, where do we situate ourselves? It's important that we, um, how to put it, that we construct our own ideas. Okay. So the, the the risk for me about looking to historical resources to locate ourselves in order to kind of situate or to navigate our way out you know, to, to to the post capitalist is that in a way we don't give ourselves enough credence to construct our own damn ideas, to construct our own art, uh, and and just just to get on with that project immediately. So my sense is that the resources have to still to be generated in a way. Uh, and for me, that's the kind of great moment in, in accelerationism, which is it's, it's work to be done from now for the future. Um, so the problem for me with resources, it starts to become about disciplinary and academic, territorial, you're a Marxist, I'm not a Marxist, and that kind of stuff, which is essentially quite boring in the end, and not, not really the construction of the post capitalist run them through order. What is contemporary art? It's undefinable. That's, that's exactly my argument. Uh, that the undefinability of contemporary art is a convenience but it's also in a way a genre definition uh, of, of contemporary art. When it started probably with uh, the late 50s around that Capra reaction to modernism, the contemporary being another way of saying modern without saying modern 
when will it end? I'll probably lose this argument, so it'll be another 100 years or something. If I win, <laughs> it'll be about another 20. Uh, but it's a lot of political work right, um, to, to win the claim. But it's, it's a minor claim, and it's a counter-hegemonic claim. So there's a very strong sense that this is a losing argument, not in terms of its rigor or political claim, but just in terms of power. Right? Uh, so in terms of art not belonging to a system, I think, I think the idea that art is asystemic is a, is a retrospective fantasy or a schema imposed on the history of art from the basis of contemporary art. It's clear that um, in, in Renaissance period, art was an entirely systemic actor. Right? The beauty of the artwork is everything to do with patronage, organized through religion. That's clearly a systemic action of the artwork. Mm -hmm. It's read as a power mechanism that we don't actually look to art of that period even in that way now, and we look for something in terms of, you can see this in terms of didactics in museums, the didactics are set up in order for the recipient or the viewer of the artwork to try and organize their own meaning of the artwork, right? Through the aesthetics and through the paintings and so on and so forth. Um, that's a contemporary art stipulation on what art has been. More recently, the projects of the, the political projects of the early 20th century, full of artists and artworks belonging to the political project, right? You mentioned futurism. The good model for us would probably, in the left, would probably be some like constructivism, apart from, oops, it ended up in communism in that nasty way that we don't like, right? So it seems to me that in modernism, and modernism itself, even, even Abex modernism, was a, was a response to a systems program that Greenberg defined better than anyone else. But it had a systemic and intrinsic logic to it, which artworks were responding to, and to which they contributed as statements, right? The artworks were statements within a systemic logic which is called modernism. Contemporary art just abandoned all of that systematicity. It didn't abandon. It actively attacked any notion of systemic endeavor of the artwork in favor of the singularity of recipient, right, of the, of the interpretive moment. But what we now understand at this point is that emphasis on the individual as the constructor of meaning fits in very well with the whole, with the whole notion of a neoliberal hegemon. Right? It's another, na another name of it is semantic precarity. Right? When you use the term precarity at that point, you can see entirely its kind of convergence with dominant political forces and economic forces of the last 40 years. So it seems to me, even if the problem is that art does play a systemic role, contemporary art does play a systemic role, but doesn't allow itself the capacity to act systemically because of its insistence upon the singularity of the artwork and the singularity of interpretation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good question. Um, I mean, it's interesting. So uh, uh, some Italian Marxist feminist, um, thinking of Fortunati, for instance, um, point out that actually um, when you do have a sort of uh, technology which enables the automation of care labor at home, domestic labor at home, what it has meant is not a reduction in the workload of a domestic laborer, but instead actually a, a raising of the standards. Uh, so you look over the course of the 20th century, um, the, the standards for cleanliness of a house, for instance, have gone up and up and up. Uh, so actually the automation of labor has meant more work. Now I think it's quite interesting, and I think um, it's something to be very aware of and very wary of in terms of the automation of, um, conti continued automation of domestic labor. I think we can distinguish between broadly uh, some domestic labor which we would want automated, uh, things like cleaning, for instance, if we could get like a Roomba, which actually does a great job, like that'd be great. Um, there's robots now which fold clothes, which sounds great to me. Um, so I think we can plausibly sort of divide home labor between things which we do want automated and which we should invest in, um, and labor which at least most of us don't want automated. Now I don't say all of us, because we have people like Shulam of Firestone, who says, well, we should automate reproductive labor completely. Um, and you know, some people may be on board with that, and if they're on board with that, I'm not going to tell them no. Um, but I think most of us want 
to give more value to care labor and affective labor. Um, what I think a post-work world offers for that is a revaluation of that labor. So as it stands right now, this labor is done completely for free. Uh, universal basic income at least gives some rec uh, recognizes it to some degree. And I think this is an important first step at least. Um, it also enables us to then choose exactly what sort of labor we want to do. Do you want to be doing a shit job at, you know, for an employer, or would you rather be staying at home, taking care of children, family, or whatever the case may be? Uh, so it enables us to actually have some choice over exactly what we're doing. I think a post-work world, if properly designed, enables us to do these sorts of things and really start reflecting on exactly how we do organize domestic, uh, domestic labor, affective labor, reproductive labor, all of this sort of stuff. Um, and the sex work thing, I think, as well. Um, you know, most of us probably don't want an automated robot to do sex work for us, but, you know, there's probably some people who want that, and I'm not going to be there to tell them no. Um, they probably wouldn't want you there. Yeah, they probably wouldn't want me there either. <laughs> but I think, I think essentially the post, um, post sort of capitalist project enables us to have many more options and enables us to step back from the sort of uh, stresses of everyday life to really rethink how we organize all of this stuff in an ideal world. Uh, um, I have a question which is, uh, you know, I guess in this discussion of post-capitalism, what are your like, sort of thoughts on relationship between, say, global systems and local systems, because I have a feeling that, like, post-capitalism, it, it privileges, or capitalism, it, it privileges global systems at the sacrifice of, you know, um, local populations, and, and, you know, if you were to speculate on a new type of art, the narratives and scenarios and context would be so radically different, you know, uh, from one to another, so, yeah, I guess, just because I haven't heard global yeah, or global, you know, like I mean, I think one of the reasons why so many leftist movements have failed over the past 40 years is precisely because they haven't aimed at the global. Now, what I mean by this is essentially that capitalism is an expansionary force. Its very logic requires it to expand spatially, temporarily, uh, temporally uh, and into new commodities, new markets, all of this. So capitalism in its very heart expands. And if you don't sort of focus at eliminating it at a global level, it's sort of like a virus that's going to expand and expand again. And I think this is sort of the problem with um, a sort of logic of withdrawal or a logic of just creating temporary autonomous zones. Um, these things are going to be temporary. They aren't going to change the global fabric of capitalism. Now, about the local, though, I think you're absolutely right. And the sort of the important aspect about post-capitalism is that it has to enable a plurality of futures. Uh, so it can't be a sort of universal linear logic at the way, you know, sort of traditional Eurocentric view of history, for instance. And if you look at somebody, a decolonial thinker like Walter Mignolo, for instance, is very, very interesting because he argues for a decolonial perspective, which is essentially we need a plurality of futures. And I agree with him on that. But he's very careful to note that in order to enable a decolonial world, we actually have to get beyond capitalism first. He's very explicit on this. Uh, and I, I completely agree with him. I think we need to get beyond capitalism. We need to think about post-capitalism as the immediate problem. Then we can start thinking about how a liberation from work uh, enables us to start developing plural futures rather than just a, a single one. Yeah, can I just uh, can I take that up? I think the local global, um, local global distinction has to be formulated in terms of what I'm calling large-scale complex integrated societies. Right. Which means that the global isn't necessarily happening on the large scale, and the local isn't necessarily happening on the small scale. The local can happen on a large scale. Uh, the local can be highly integrated, and the global can be somewhat unintegrated. Right? So it, it sort of stops being a territorial organization and stops being geographically beholden and starts becoming much more about systemic actions. So in terms of, um, uh, in terms of just, just use the art field as an example, uh, there's a claim, which I think is somewhat spurious, that, uh, say, post-internet art would be some kind of global phenomena. But we all, I mean, it's kind of relatively well established that it's a phenomena belonging to maybe 100 people in New York and maybe half that number in Berlin and maybe 20 in London, right? But it's, it's, so it's local, but it belongs to, it belongs to a large-scale complex integrated formation called contemporary art. Equally, something like post-colonial art 
from, say, Nigeria, works very well, which is regional, right, and local in geographical terms, works very well on a biennial circuit celebrating the post-colonial, which it generally does. And that's a kind of global art. So the regional becomes kind of globalized, qua regional, and, and the global becomes extremely local, as there's just a very small number of actors acting in this way and that way, but they're very close to the hegemonic centers of power. So local and global have to be uh, uh, distinguished from the, the, the territorial uh, sense in which that, that those terms are usually taken up. Um, and I think what that means is that local and global become scalar issues of large-scale complex and creative societies. That is like small-scale and large-scale. I wonder if you might want to pick up on the notion of hyperstition again, so you mentioned it briefly, as this kind of social technology which sort of mediates between, I guess what you would call them, the more molar levels, and take the bills of which are terms, the social subjection, narratives, myths, representations, those kinds of subjections, and the molecular, the more machinic enslavement aspects, which, you know, algorithmic you know, affects, pre-conscious, the human, non-human, whether that's a technology that might actually be useful in thinking about uh, coming up with art practices that leverage these two things. Because in a sense, we can't be completely bodies without organs, right? There's, there's still a molar level, the level of narrative, there's a level of myth making. The left also needs to kind of grab hold of it. So I'm wondering, you know, um, if you think of hyperstition as this kind of mediating technology between these, this very molar level and this more molecular level where you really have to get down to the nitty gritty. I think yes. <laughs> uh, qualified yes. Um, the the the. I mean, the, the hypersticial in a way is not the name for the moment of constructing a program which has traction. Okay. Um, so the the issue is kind of well, what has traction, and what are the terms by which uh, one can one can organize a program which which is globally transformative. Like it's transformative in an integrated way. Um, and, and so I think uh, as a form of, um, as a term of the construction of the program, I mean, hyperstition, if those of you aren't familiar with it, I, as I understand it, uh, is you, a proposal is put forward, um, and then the very act of putting forward the proposal enables its realization. Right? So you start off with fiction, essentially, of, like, this will happen, and the very fact that it's around is then a kind of uh, a cause in a way. It's a kind of final cause for the acts that need to take place in order for that final for that uh, for that statement to to be occasioned in real life. Um, so I think I think yes, it can act as a, as, as what you're calling the integration between the molar and the molecular. Um, I'm a I'm a little anxious, I guess, in that determination between and it came up with the previous question around affect. As, as a name for what might be happening at the level of the molecular. Um, uh, and I, th I think what I'd be interested in would be, uh, I think my commitment would be more to um, a, a rational systemic demand, right? Uh, and the demand would be one which would, which would, which actually would be an imperative for moral reasons and political reasons, as well as the, the obvious justice of the claim. Now, I, I don't know if the term hyperstition is needed in order to articulate any of that. It seems to me to belong to, to a kind of discourse which, um, which uh, puts too much pressure or uh, sort of relies too much on a kind of notion of a performative, performative uh, construction, a notion of kind of a performative engineering, uh, which, which uh, I, think, uh, I think takes out the sort of moral moment of the politics that's being put forward, proposed. But don't you think hyperstition, though, as a way into understanding some of the complexities that we're trying to understand here is a way of kind of, well, to use a computer technology, kind of pinging a kind of system to see what responds, and that gives us a sense of how a system functions, how things circulate, and that might allow us to, in some sense, just find a more kind of generalizable set of strategies based on so as a sure. way of kind of... Yeah, no, that, that, that would be a good way of thinking about art as a systemic actor. Like, what, what are the repercussions of the artwork systemically? But the, the artwork then, what's important about it wouldn't be the sort of moment of reception or semant individuated semantic construction, but precisely the systemic effects it has 
and one can test the system and its affordances in that way. So that would be good. Yeah. Just have time for one last question. Hi, uh, two questions. First, about the distinction between the left and the right axle of rationalism. My question is the distinction in the end goes down philosophically to the notion of agency because, like, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the right wing accelerationism, at least in Nick Lang, has to do with like, uh, like a macro ontological process or something like that. So, no matter what you do in the end, it's going to happen so, so, right? And I think like left wing, at least in the manifesto, points out not naive voluntarism because you rely on science, technology, or resources that are available, but in the end it's more like about what it is possibly and feasible for us to do. Uh, so I, I think that could be a distinction because a lot could play the joke that I, I, I like, uh, I, I believe it was like a period, is like you could get like for a right wing accelerationism. You can buy left wing accelerationism for, for uh, you can buy it and then get the right wing for free because it's going to happen in the end, right? Um, so, but, but I, I, I am obviously like sympathetic to the website and I, I do not believe in this dissolution of agency, but I was, I, I was asking about if you think that's about like the philosophical kernel of the distinction. And finally, in the case of, of art, uh, because it has to do with how we accelerate or how we understand to accelerate. Uh, I wanted to ask you if, if in your notion of, of the criticism of contemporary art, you cannot point out examples, but this a systemic or formal approach also considers not only the content, but the way the, the artistic practice of an object is situated in the commodification process. So, so uh, I wanted to ask you if you could expand a little bit of that, like, should be a, a, a formal position in, 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 in relation to the state or to the market or to the uh, institution of the artistic uh, meaning or something like that? Um, I'll take the first question. I think, uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There is a, a, a distinction between the agencies uh, involved between left and right accelerationism. Um, I mean, Land in the 90s was basically arguing capital, would, capital was the agent, uh, which oddly enough mirrors a lot of left Marxists as well, who say capital is the agent of, of everything. Um, I, I, think, I think it's just empirically and philosophically false. Um, and l so left accelerationism is broadly more uh, interested in um, the agency of the people, I'll say, is I think the important one. Now, it's interesting in terms of Land's sort of weird racist turn in the, the, the past, I don't know, couple of years, because I think he's actually faced up to the situation where originally Marxism thought, well, capital will be um, its own demise, lead to its own demise by its own agency. Land likewise thought, okay, well, capitalism will lead to this sort of singularity moment, uh, the demise of humanity, yada, yada, yada. In the 1920s and 30s and so, Marxists suddenly have to reflect on the fact that this hasn't happened. And actually, the working class seems more and more content with capitalism. Likewise with land, and I'm, I'm taking this argument from uh, a friend of mine, Amy Ireland, so I'll give her credit for it. Um, she argues actually that land has had to face up to a similar sort of problem, which is that he made these arguments in the 1990s, and it hasn't seemed to happen at all. And so he now has to argue exactly what has gone wrong with his idea about capital being the agent. Uh, and he seems to want to say, well, it's you know, politics and all of this stuff. Um, I don't know how racism fits into it, but I, you know, I haven't read him. Um, I just sort of like, well, he's a racist. I don't care. I don't need to read him anymore. Um, but I think it's an interesting hypothesis in terms of the sort of systemic perspective on, on what he's up to. Um, yeah, I think around the left-right accelerationism argument, um, the, the argument's only an argument if you think right accelerationism has any validity. Not for political reasons, but theoretical uh, or, or kind of conceptual validity. And it doesn't. It's, it's just it's a nonsense. It's an idealism, uh, which kind of uh, depoliticized capitalism as a as an autonomous system without capitalists. Uh, I think the model of capitalism it has is fundamentally flawed, um, and it all kind of the, the automation argument in a way like sort of yes, capitalism is the agent, but it's an automatic agent. Seems to me a kind of uh, in, in a weird way a naive reduction of what capitalism in fact is as an internally as an internally um, conflictual system. Right? My, my, the, cap the notion of capitalism I'm 
more interested in is one espoused by Nitzan and Bishop. Uh, Nitzan teaches at the University of Toronto here, uh, which is about capitalists as an intra-capitalist conflict without direction, apart from the expansion in order to generate more revenues per capitalist rather than for capitalism as a whole. Right? If you have that, you don't have a sense of direction around capitalism apart from just the expansion that Nick is talking about. But that isn't, that's not progressive automatically or necessarily. Okay, so you can get neo-feudal capitalisms, which are obviously not heading towards like, more complex societies, but want to reduce complexity and so on. Um, so I think, I think uh, for me, it's kind of not worth engaging with right accelerationism because I just don't think it's a credible argument to begin with, or it's a credible position. It makes for, it makes for fun on internet, uh, on internet, <laughs> on Facebook. Um, but so what? It's not, it doesn't matter. Um, sorry, Facebook fans, but it just doesn't matter. Um, so around the contemporary art thing, no, you're completely right. The, the, the demand is precisely that contemporary art should be responsible and, and incorporate the infrastructural conditions of contemporary art in what that art is. Right? So the, the, the movement around commodification, which is not simply commodity, but it kind of is a commodity, the double play it has between its, its uh, ostensibly moral political content and its, and its uh, uh, convenient, convenience for the construction of something that completely contradicts the claims of that content, all of that stuff, uh, and there's much more to be said around it, all of that stuff needs to be integrated into what the content of the art is. The semantics of the work isn't just the semantics of the work, but where it's placed. Right? So why, for example, I mean, the, the immediate example would be why this exhibition in this museum now? Well, what's not told to you, unless you're one of the professionals, is that it's there because the gallery paid the museum to host an exhibition by this or that artist. That's not the semantics of the work, allegedly, but of course it completely is. Because right? the, the, act, the art is a political actor in the construction of the social. Right? And we need, to, we need to have that semantics in in relationship to what the semantics of the work itself is. Because without the two together, we're seeing half the picture. And that's another name for that is political deception. It's interesting that we're having this conversation because we're both posing a challenge in a context of an exhibition that's also called Challenge for Change. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to thank AF and then behind me, which side is power? We've got the 1%, the 99%. They, they do. What? They do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you very much, Sarah and Nick, for coming to your talk to us this evening.